started, okay? It's hard for us to move around. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we got the warm-up act out of the way. We can get to the meat of the presentations now, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. You guys did a spectacular job. Everybody was the energy and the, the, the care that you put in to make this worth our time. So thank you all uh, for that work. Now we are going to student services and administrative support. And the, uh, give me a friend, who's, who's speaking? Um, Jim Gagne and uh, Patrick, okay, all right. Yeah, Linda, I know, okay. Michael, good, all right. You guys know the order of March, go for it. Oh, let me, one if you're not following, I don't know how many of us are online, but there's more than 100 people watching as we, uh, as we sit here right now. So I'm really delighted that, uh, uh, that the work is being distributed despite our best efforts. So anyway, thank you. And, and let's thank the staff. This, I think there's a new venture for us. So you guys did a great job putting this together. We really appreciate it. Great. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Jim. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Oliver, if Seminole is a pair of old, worn shoes, Career Development Services is a pair of old, thin socks with holes in every toe. Good morning, everyone. As director of your Career Development Services Department, I often ask myself the following question. Are our students properly prepared for seeking and securing desirable employment after graduation in an ever-increasing competitive market? And for those of people who know me well, you will not be surprised if I answer with an affirmative no, they are not prepared. Is this just my opinion? Uh, no, let me give you a few facts that will bring this forward. According to the State University of New York at Brockford, in their, their research findings, 80% of all entering college freshmen have no idea of a career direction. I think that's probably pretty true here. According to the Association of Private Sector Colleges and Universities, only 24% of college students have a job waiting for them after graduation. I doubt that that's even this high here in Pinellas County when we have 45,000 unemployed people who are gonna compete against our graduates. And over 58% of all college graduates, only 58% of all college graduates find employment in their uh, career-related field that matches their college major. That's one out of two. So clearly something is wrong if these numbers are correct. Do our students want career guidance? I think it's clear that they do from the student leadership conference that was held in 2010. Career guidance was on the top of the list of their demands. Are we meeting those needs properly? And um, we're doing an okay job, but not a great job according to the point of service surveys that have been conducted. What should we do? I believe that we should require all degree students to enroll in and complete a comprehensive program of career guidance that culminates in the development of a professional career portfolio. Well, let me see if I can give you a better example of what that might be. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with our course SLS 1301, Career and Life Planning. Take that course and put it on steroids. Add to it, make it more comprehensive, and require students to do more career planning preparation activities than they are currently doing now. Here's another way to visualize uh, this career portfolio initiative. Imagine, if you will, a three ring binder with several tab dividers. Inside this career portfolio will be all the results of the course that they have just completed. It will contain all the career testing results that we can administer to them to help them understand their interests and skills and other dimensions of their personality. It'll contain a list of all the occupations that they've actually explored. It will contain profiles of every occupation so they know something about the reality of duties and responsibilities and, and what those jobs entail in terms of skills and knowledge, salaries, so on and so forth. It will also contain the student's chosen career direction based on their understanding of which occupation best matches their interests, their skills, their values and personalities. We will actually get them to a point where they can identify a career direction. The career portfolio will also contain their educational plan, 
We'll make sure that they understand what program of training is necessary to prepare them for their career and that they understand what courses in that program are also required. Go to the second half of the career portfolio. This is more on employment planning. In that career portfolio, they will have a list of employers that they have identified through research as to be employers where they can make a difference, where they can bring value. So that means they have to research those employers, find out what they're doing, and how they can be of value to each of those employers. And then also in the portfolio will be all the materials that they need to actually seek and secure employment. All their resumes will be done, their cover letters will be done, their elevator speech will be done, their phone scripts will be done. They will have prepared for their interview and actually gone through mock interviews. Um, everything that they will need to actually start their job search campaign will be done. So think of this career um, portfolio as um, two versions. One will be in a printed format, a three-ring binder that they'll be carrying out and completing throughout their program of studies, and one will be an electronic version so that they can demonstrate to employers that they have those highly desirable electronic skills. So now, with that in mind, ask the same question that I asked just beforehand, and if a student was able to do the following things, select an appropriate career direction that they actually have passion for, complete a program of training to prepare for that career direction, identify which employers that they can make a difference with and why those employers would be willing to hire them, and then learn how to market themselves properly and successfully to those employers. Then we would ask the same question, are we properly preparing our students? The answer would be yes, in my opinion. Well, how does this career portfolio initial, an initiative help St. Petersburg College? One, it will establish a common set of career objectives that every student on every campus can, be, um, can achieve. It will give us measurable data as to how well we're doing in career development services, something that we, we don't have at this particular point. And it will fulfill our obligations to properly prepare students for life for life after college. We do an excellent job on the academic side. We need to do better on the career preparation side of our responsibilities. Um, how will it help students? Uh, first and, and most importantly, they will be certified career ready. That when they leave our work, we can feel comfortable that we have done everything possible to prepare them for seeking and securing relevant career uh, in employment. I don't want to have to discuss any more with parents why Johnny or Sally or whatever, after spending forty to sixty thousand dollars in their in debt, is working at one of the big box stores. It's a conversation I dread and one that is very difficult to answer. So I'm asking in this initiative that we do a, a much different approach. My wife mentioned to me this morning, she said, when you, when you go, remember the old slogan we used to use when we were at America Online was, go big or go home. And I thought about that this morning, <laughs> and I thought, okay, let's do this the right way. And we need uh, professional career counselors on every one of our learning centers. We need uh, career guidance technicians. We have a long way to go to just catch up to some of our other colleges across the United States, but I think it's something that we can do. We have the right leadership, and I'm, I'm asking for a budget of approximately $700,000 to bring forth that initiative. And I made it in under three, which is almost impossible for me, if you know me. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Good morning. I'm before you this morning to request um, uh, funding for four initiatives to support the college's strategic goal and the college experience. The first of these requests is for the Cecil B. Keene Enrichment Program to be housed at the Midtown Center. Typically, this is the time of year that we actually do requests for, um, for funding for this program. We have been advised to request this for two years, 2011 as well as 2012. 
the program in itself um, actually works with middle and high school students to strengthen their academic ability to be more college ready. Last year, 2010, we were at Midtown. We served 30 students uh, and their parents. The program was successful. We pre and post tested students that came in. Initially, 30% of those students had some knowledge of what it required to enter college. They also had some uh, knowledge or, or knowledge of their uh, performance academically and what they needed to do. Our post test showed a 70% increase uh, in the six week period of time students in these areas. And so we feel that this program actually supports students being college ready as well as giving them the experience of being on a college campus, working with and I am requesting uh, $15,000 for each of those years for a total of $30,000 for the summer enrichment program to be housed at The next of these initiatives is the College Reach Out Program. We were advised that the College Reach Out Program is a strategic initiative in this budget request because what we do is to bring SPC, which is a part of the Tampa Bay Consortium, which is Hills Community College, University of South Florida, and State We serve as the fiscal agent for the consortium. In our working with students, typically, historically, St. Petersburg College has paid 50% of the coordinator and staff assistant positions. For the past two to three years, the budget from the state has been decreasing, which means our administrative costs are high, and the um, funds that we have to actually serve students is only 21% compared to here college which is 85.5 percent of their funds go directly to students USF 55.5 percent and State College of Florida 36.1 percent so our request is that we receive an additional sixty thousand dollars to cover the uh, staff assistant and uh, coordinator of the program to bring us more in line with direct funds going to our students and, and providing them services. Our third request is for the Summer of Success program for 2011-2012. The same is true for this. Typically, we ask for these funds uh, at this time of year from the financial assistance services. And we were asked to uh, at request this period of time so that we could be in line with our budget request for 2000. The summer of success, we're asking that the funding be provided for all four main campuses, St. Petersburg, Gibbs, Clearwater, Tarpon Springs, and Seminole Campus. <laughs> Last year, we served 108 recently high school, recent high school graduates. 106 of those completed the program. 103 or 96 percent of the completers registered for the fall classes. Their overall GPA was 2.8. These results are support the college experience for students entering SPC. This request, however, is a slight increase over, over last year's. A more detailed budget uh, will be provided. Uh, our actual request is for $264,801.80 to cover two summers. Our last request is for the Student Support Services Program to be housed on Seminole and Tarpon Springs campuses. And if I could have those provosts, please join me. The Student Support Services Program is a federally funded program. Uh, currently on the Clearwater and St. Pete Gibbs campus. It has, according to the Department of Education, an 86% persistence rate. It has a 98% academic good standing. 
And in the year of 2008-09, which the summary was completed, it had a 28% transfer graduation rate. And I'll tell you why that was so. Because our students remained in our baccalaureate program here. They also remained to complete AS degrees. So that was a 28% for 08-09, down from 70% the year prior. Okay, according to our, our uh, data from our AI 31% of the students on the Seminole campus were in need of this program. They met all eligibility criteria. On the Top on Springs campus, 30% of those students met the need to be a part of student support services. So what we are requesting $105,301.76 to be able to support this program on these two campuses. Yes. Well, both Jim and I are about having these services on our campuses. Now, uh, the number is very, very, very strong. Uh, my personal experience with the program is through the bridge program, the sum of success, and it was a fun of the 21 students we got. We had a target of 20, but we got 21 students. Services program if we had it on our campus. I strongly support this. On the campus. It's a proven program of success for students. The statistics are phenomenal. This is another one for both of us. But remember that, that, that this, is, this is a student success program that works. I felt so strongly about this program, and you know how tight space is at the Seminole campus. I've got a portable set aside just waiting for this program to start because it's a proven winner. If we are granted the funding for the student support services on the campuses, it would reduce the request for summer of success by $21,000 in staff. Are there any questions? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Financial aid assistance forward a request to bring services to all SPC locations and is requesting adding three additional counselors. The first one would be at St. Petersburg Gibbs campus. We currently have 14,500 students, 43% of our financial aid applicants at St. Pete Gibbs and only three administrative staff there. Our second counselor would bring services to downtown, midtown. You heard Yvonne speak earlier of the need for that. These are our fastest growing locations containing high need, high minority populations. All state HEC center. Our police academy is eligible for clock hour financial aid. However, SPC has not offered it. would also support workforce initiatives and the expansion of clock hour programs. Would also provide financial aid counseling to the HEC campus that currently has 58 financial aid recipients receiving $20 million. All three of these positions are supported by all four provosts could attest to the need for 13% 19%, 17%, and 21%. These numbers represent the increases right now of financial aid applicants, FAFSA applications, awarded, and dollars awarded. If we look over a three-year, 46%, 54%, 56%, 69 percent we have 100 St. Pete Gibbs, I mean St. Pete College, and these numbers are staggering. At other colleges, if they were facing these 
see them on Bay News trying to handle angry students. Despite that, in the past year, our financial assistance area had the highest year-to-year -year student satisfaction increase of all SPC areas. An amazing accomplishment by our staff. We challenged them, they stepped up, and they delivered. These three counselor positions will also support implementing 894 pages of new federal regulations, which have uh, numerous changes in SAP and in verification. Uh, one of the things we've learned in the past two years was that OPS and FLEX team does, does not help us. We need qualified financial aid counselors to address our needs. The one-time cost for this request is $136,194. This investment translates to increased tuition revenue and enrollment and student satisfaction. Our second request is for a counselor to lead us in the areas of financial literacy, debt management, default aversion, and loan counseling. On February 4th, 2011, the Department of Ed released its last trial set of three-year cohort loan default data, and St. Pete College is above the national cohort default rate for two-year and for three-year. Under the new regulations, colleges with a three-year default rate of 30% or higher for three consecutive years could lose federal aid eligibility. Currently, federal aid accounts for 90% of all aid dispersed at St. Pete College, $100 million. Once the new law takes effect, if a college default rate goes above 40% and for any single year, it would lose eligibility. I will say it again, that's $100 million. In the past, financial literacy, debt management, default aversion, and loan counseling was performed by guarantee agencies and lenders. With the uh, currently St. Peak College has 28% increase in student loan borrowers, 70% increase in student loan dollars, and loans represent 63% aid. The one-time cost of this initiative is we would also use this counselor as a swing during peak periods to go where the processing is needed at most. In closing, one thing here is my staff and I cannot do it alone. If you like the changes you've been seeing these past two years, faster processing, happy students, improved website, financial aid TV, I can tell you that myself and my staff are just getting started. I came here to create the best financial aid office in the country. Thank you. Questions? Good morning, everyone. Uh, many of you, or some of you might know that I have uh, two teenage boys. Uh, most of you probably don't know that I live in Seminole. And I'm sure that um, uh, nobody knows that my two teenage boys are clothes horse. Uh, each of them has uh, more shoes than my wife. So Jim, if you want to start a shoe collection in Seminole, stop by my house and be happy to help. is one of those 4,000 students at Osceola High School in the culinary program and uh, would be very interesting in the culinary program here at SBC. I have uh, three um, items to present for your consideration this morning. Uh, college experience and one of them relates to the education agenda. Uh, the first one is uh, mandatory face-to-face -face orientation. Back in November of 2010, we had a sort of lab to look at the student experience. And um, one of the strong recommendations from that collaborative lab was to reinstitute a face-to-face -face orientation for new students. If you've been here for um, 
a period of time, uh, eight to ten years ago, we used to have that. And then with technology, we went to an entirely uh, online orientation. Uh, so we're proposing that we uh, re-implement a face-to-face -face mandatory orientation for new students, um, especially students who test into two or more areas of college prep work when they get here. Um, the amounts for that uh, basically equate to uh, $16,000 in recurring OPS money that would be um, given to the sites to backfill uh, budgeted personnel uh, who would present these orientation sessions. Uh, also, about $30,000 in premiums, um, T-shirts, and a flash drive for every new student who attends the orientation to help them feel uh, engaged from the start. And uh, the, the major part of this uh, budget request is for each campus to have a uh, mobile laptop center um, equipped with 15 laptops so that the orientation would not be locked down into one physical room. Any classroom with a teaching bunker that has a computer and a projector orientation. And I think I've got the support of the provost on that. Uh, my second initiative uh, relates to the completion agenda, and it is to uh, ask for some support uh, in terms of dollars for the Senate Bill 1908 placement testing that we are uh, we're doing. For those of you not aware of what that is, basically uh, we're in our third year of testing uh, legislation that uh, uh, was passed three years ago that requires uh, state colleges to partner with their districts and uh, make available to high school juniors the, the placement test. Um, when we did this, uh, the, the first year we had, I think, about 300, 400 students that tested. Last year we had about 1,000 students that tested. Last year we actually went into three high schools and, and administered the placement test. This spring we are going into nine high schools. We've already been into three uh, this month, and we're going, we have six more to go over the next eight weeks. So we, I only expect this uh, effort uh, to increase uh, the, the um, excuse me, the principals from the high schools have gotten behind this. They recognize the benefit of testing their students. Uh, it prepares their students for college. There's, there's uh, courses that the students can take while they're still in high school if they're deficient in an area uh, so that when they get to us, they are college ready. Uh, it provides opportunities for dual enrollment. And uh, actually, uh, the school district is using the results if the students are at college level uh, they're reporting those students to the state as college ready to help improve their individual school grade so the benefits of uh, college placement testing in the high schools is numerous um, this year we have utilized flex team we have us utilized OPS dollars we have utilized high uh, our college recruiters um, we've util utilized the personnel in the testing centers at each of the campuses to try and keep up with the demand. And we've actually turned down two high schools that have asked us to come out and test for Senate Bill 1908 because we simply don't have any more resources to throw at this. And over and above Senate Bill 1908 is the Gibbs High School outreach that we did in the fall. If that's going to be a, a strategic initiative that we're going to continue to do in, in the future, uh, we're going to need more support, more support for test proctoring and more support for uh, the cost of the test units themselves. My last item uh, for your consideration is um, two personnel, two new uh, personnel in our central records department. Um, With each of these requests, I've, I have attachments on the SharePoint site. Uh, I'm requesting one uh, career service position to assist with records intake and processing in central records, and one uh, FTE, also a career service grade level two, to assist with uh, graduation. Uh, over the last four years, the number of students that have applied to SPC has increased by 40%. I'm pleased to tell you that um, whereas in 2000, in 2010, uh, we have basically inverted that, and 80% of the students 
applied uh, online. What that's done is it's increased the need for um, central records to do all of the residency verification. A lot of that was done on the campuses when it was done on the campuses. But since these are all, not all, but 80 percent, last year almost 17,000 applications of students who applied online, Central Records has the burden now to verify that the residency information that the student submitted online is accurate. We're using technology not only in the application process, but we're using technology in that process as well, using the state's uh, driver's DMV database to help us. But still, we, we're basically to avoid audit criticisms uh, in, a, in a position where we're looking at every application and the residency information submitted by the student. Uh, we've also had a tremendous, almost 60 percent increase in, in the number of students who have requested hard copy transcripts to be mailed out. We, we do have the ability to send EDI or electronic transcripts to other schools, other colleges in Florida. Uh, but uh, last year we had 26,000 students request uh, or 26,000 hard copy transcripts that were requested to be sent out. That's postage, et cetera. So we've got one person devoted to that, and she's, uh, she is over her head. That's a 59% increase in transcript requests in four years. Um, graduation processing, we've had a 21% 21, 21 increase in the number of uh, applications for graduation in the last three years. Every student who applies to graduate, we've got somebody in central records that's doing a degree audit to make sure that the, uh, that the student's on track. And if they're not, we communicate to that student, let them know in advance you're missing three credit hours in this area, what have you. Um, and finally, um, if you look at the presentation that I have on SharePoint, you'll see that I've, I've put um, the FTE, how many, how many employees we have in central records, uh, in the growth over the last five years, and we have grown, but uh, it's not all. You need to look at the um, footnotes that I've provided there. In addition to the to the growth, we've assumed some additional responsibilities. That graduation auditing that I just mentioned used to be done on the campuses. We've absorbed that in central records. Also, um, uh, the international students that apply to the college that used to be handled on the campuses and we have centralized that function and we did add a position for, for that and um, we did move uh, two people from the sites to central records to keep up with graduation but the, the demand uh, the workload is still uh, far outweighs the work that these two people can keep up with so that's my um, that, those are my requests be happy to entertain any questions Thank you very much. <clears throat> Greetings. I'm number uh, 14. I'm Dan Bartow, Director of Campus or College-Wide Security Services. And on behalf of College-Wide Security Services, we're here requesting funds for one officer to be assigned here at the Epi Complex. Um, before, or in order to give you a better understanding of why we're requesting that officer and, and what the needs are for, it really helps to have a history of the reorganization of the security department. Seven years ago, security was a mixture of in-house and contract officers. Um, the tragedy at Virginia Tech in 07 kind of turned everybody's eyes to college security. And in consultation with uh, my administrator, it was decided to bring security totally in-house, 99% officers. Um, two years ago, uh, it became obvious that with 38 reportees that another organizational structure was going to be needed. And to that end, we divided the college properties into three sectors. And because I lack an imagination, we basically call them north, central, and south sectors. Each sector had three campuses in it. Epi is part of the north sector. Um, all of our sites basically through partnerships, student-supported uh, functions, um, contracts, and whatnot, we have offerings on the weekends, Epi is no different. 
Um, this officer would be hired and assigned to cover not only the weekends, but to also supplement and complement the existing officers that are here. It would provide us the uh, necessary manpower to basically be able to visit the buildings as necessary. Right now, traditionally, they're patrolled by one officer that's covering four uh, buildings that are geographically um, We think the shift in organization has resulted in a higher quality of personnel and, and recent student surveys show that. Three years ago, we were support services uh, this past year as number one. We're proud of that. The officer that did cover relief duty, supplemental duties here was transferred to the Tarpon Springs campus with the advent of their new building and with their phenomenal growth up there in the new uh, Olympia building. So they another officer. The request this year reflects one officer at an average salary and with benefits, which is approximately Are there any questions? I'm here to answer them. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm here this morning to talk about the uh, audiovisual design and engineering for St. Petersburg College. Uh, everything that you see in here today, uh, this room, projectors, uh, all of the video screens, all the switching, uh, that's all designed by AV engineers. Currently at St. Petersburg College, we have an AV engineer. Uh, several years ago, we had three. Uh, Due to the cuts we had funding several years ago, those two positions were pulled. So for the last few years, we've been basically paying contractors to oversee all the AV design and engineering uh, for the college. Um, this is this has created a number of problems. Um, one, you know, we don't get uh, timely. Uh, uh, timely initiation of these projects and it's created a significant, I think, cost issue uh, where things that we can do ourselves, or instead we're paying contractors to do this. So uh, basically in a nutshell, for $50,000 uh, uh, to reinstate the position, uh, one position that we lost in order to, to provide this AV design. Um, this in, I think this is going to actually save money for the college. We spend thousands of dollars more than what we would put into uh, the salary position. So um, that's pretty much it. This. Good morning. Um, I got two uh, requests uh, for your consideration. The first request is to enhance the student system for um, student services. Uh, there are a, a few things which have been identified by the student uh, team as very important for the student uh, experience. Uh, one of the initiatives is uh, an individualized learning plan for every credit student who comes here. Um, I'm uh, requesting uh, a contract programmer uh, for about 15 months uh, to complete, to augment the staff which we have in AIS uh, to complete uh, that initiative. Uh, also, um, what, you know, as you have seen on all MAP centers, the students are coming there for very simple requests which we can, I believe, uh, provide to them online and we can give that information just in time when they need it and very easily nav navigate uh, navigation so that the students don't have to come to the campus and map centers and have the lines there for simple information as to when my financial aid is going to be dispersed or what to receive my documents okay so i think we can use the technology to our benefit and uh, really create a, a a very nice system where students can um, navigate get information and reduce the lines at the map center 
uh, Facebook, Twitter, and other initiatives which are coming up, I think we can move towards that area and have student system really uh, create. I think you know we can do that with a contact programmer. Uh, so I'm asking one time uh, money for initiative. Uh, the second initiative which uh, I'm requesting for is uh, actually a, a new position for a program analyst. College who are using scanning system today, uh, financial aid, central records. Uh, there is an initiative to uh, enhance departments within the college. Um, Uh, scanning system has, which we are not have any support or programming which we can provide from a centralized location. Uh, financial aid is, uh, you know, has a person who is trying to support that, but uh, you know, it's really uh, a central IT uh, functionality. So, um, so I'm I'm proposing that we uh, have a new position created who can support the uh, scanning initi initiative within the college, also. The same, you know, the part of that position will also support who is next. Uh, as you may know, uh, we got who is next as a Title III initiative uh, a few years ago. And when Title III, there is nobody who is managing the system from location. And uh, I think uh, this position can support that function also, where we can start using the system, we can start using the data for making data decisions on the campuses. and. Um, um, and provide better service for all our students. Good morning. When I started with the college about three years ago, in addition to the planning and the budgeting, we we're also hoping to focus some resources in the areas of compliance. About my third or fourth day in the job, we got our first budget cut, and kind of the rest has been history. Over the years, we've talked periodically about different things that we could do to put resources in place for compliance, but again, with budgets being restricted, we haven't had the resources to do that. I feel now that we're really hitting some critical need. As the college moves towards more empowerment throughout the organization, I believe a consistent, organized review and risk assessment program is essential for effective management of the institution's resources. I'm requesting a dedicated compliance analyst position that would provide internal oversight and proactive monitoring of our processes, practices, and transactions. Some of the things that they would look at, and this is just a few things on the list, would be tracking and coordinating changes to our processes when legislation changes to ensure all of those are properly implemented. With expanding the new P-card process, making sure that those transactions are looked at. Reviewing positions against security access and AIS to be sure those are appropriate, as well as just regular reviews of our practices against what we've actually put in our board procedures. This position would also be able to build a program to ensure success of managers as we're implementing more of the empowerment initiatives. This would enable the college to provide prudent monitoring of business at the back end so that we're not having to hold up business and transactions on the front end. Also, the position would be able to watch and make sure that we're maintaining appropriate controls and separation of duties as required by legislation and be in compliance. With tightening budgets, we're all having to do more with less, but the stat does add more risk to the organization in those areas. And finally, this position would be able to put some time in to implement a more robust fraud prevention and awareness program, and hopefully a hotline process for both students and employees. Any questions? Thank you.
Good morning. I represent Facility Services, and um, I want to start by saying that um, I want to emphasize the fact that we understand our role. We are Facility Services. We are here to facilitate and to serve. Um, we do not deliver the uh, education and clearly to uh, help those students get to class in the best condition for learning, and that's important to us. I know it's important to you, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with you on that. Uh, we have two initiatives. The first one is um, pretty remotely uh, affiliated with what we do, but it's important to us in, in, in the fact that uh, we have a central mailroom over in the Epi Services building. That mailroom is the central uh, processing plant for all of the mail that ends up at all of our campuses. Um, this, this initial request is to upgrade the manner in which we do business in that mailroom. Uh, back in 2009, December, Mike O'Keefe and his group uh, acquired a new printer, a Xerox digital printer that has enormous capabilities. Many of you have uh, benefited from the, um, the opportunities to use that machine and its capabilities. We in the mailroom are downhill from that stream. We're responsible for getting that material out. And we, that, that machine helped us to identify some things that we need to do better and some opportunities to do that business in a more efficient way. We're not asking for more people. What we are asking for is some improved technology. Specifically, uh, we have three machines in there now, two processing machines um, and one uh, folder slash inserter. We want to replace those antiquated machines with new leased equipment. We think uh, we agree with Doug's initiatives to go with leased equipment in the technology side because of the obsolescence factor that happens just so quickly. So we want to, uh, we want to agree to a five-year lease with a vendor that has a state contract. We have enormous maintenance costs on these existing machines that will go away. The net result is that we're looking for $5,700 to upgrade all of that equipment. It's a in my opinion, a no-brainer that uh, it just makes perfect sense to move and allow us to, to more efficiently process that mail that we do with this new machine that Mike has. Um, our second request is more, more central to the uh, education initiative and the fact that we want to improve the conditions that our students experience every day. Um, back in 2008 in facility services, as in many departments, we were asked to forfeit many positions because of budget constraints. Uh, at that time, we gave up, among other things, our daytime custodial positions. Uh, it became obviously, it became obvious very quickly that, that this was a noticeable difference. There was a noticeable degradation in the condition of the facilities during the daytime. Uh, Dr. Carney was asked, um, I think by Dr. Cooper, to look at this, talk to the different provosts, and make a recommendation. It was pretty much unanimous, if not unanimous, that that this request to bring back some of this daytime custodial help was, was important in, in, in the facilities that our students experience. Um, this proposal is to bring back those positions at each campus, but only in a part-time budgeted position. We, we feel like we can do a pretty good job, catch the areas that are most important during the most important high traffic uh, components of the day. Obviously, the increased student traffic that we've experienced over the last couple years is, has compounded this issue. and. Uh, it's with the recommendation of the provost and the provost council capable of servicing all of our facilities college-wide. Questions? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I have just one. Uh, I asked Pat to join me to maybe double of uh, getting your approval here. Uh, our issue is with the PeopleSoft database. That is, it's not equipped to handle the uh, information that is coming in from students that can be inaccurate, and it, it's um, maintain the integrity. It is enable to consistently maintain the integrity of the data uh, with changes of address, deaths, or er other variations. This has several consequences for students and departments across the college, most notably enrollment management, financial aid, marketing, the foundation, the alumni, and central records. Mail being sent money and increasing risk that students do not receive important correspondence. Losing track of students and alumni for, depart for development or recruiting purposes because we do not update our, reg our data regularly of address registry. Official 
documents being sent to students with misspellings and unprofessional presentation addresses, time wasted correcting data manually and repeatedly with each mailing. Solving would have the benefit of improving communications to current and potential students, eliminating postage fees for central mail, and effectiveness of communications and increase the college's reputation and credibility with a more professional appearance. There are num numerous ways to, numerous means to accomplish this. We recommend a committee of chief stakeholders, enrollment management, financial aid, central records, marketing, AIS, and the foundation to work together to decide the proper solution. The, the, fun the funding that we have requested is between forty and $60,000. That is having the catalog, Cadillac. We are looking for direction as to where to go. Pat has some anecdotal information to support our request. The long and the short of it is that I don't think we're as efficient with our uh, U.S. Post Office mail that goes out as we could be. Um, we used to send our employee addresses and student addresses to a service, um, I think twice a year. I'm not sure that that's being done. Uh, that service basically did two things for us. It, it uh, validated uh, addresses against the National Change of Address Database. So if the student uh, moved, and um, I just read something online this morning that 17% of all Americans move annually. I'm sure that that's higher for student or student population. But as they move, if they leave a forwarding address with the U.S. Post Office, we get that address. So we've got, a, we've got an updated address. It also uh, standardizes the addresses to the U.S. Post Office uh, requirements, which uh, will help us with uh, getting bulk rate. I got home, and I mentioned two teenage sons. One of them showed me this letter that uh, I got home last night that he got from Dr. Law. And uh, unfortunately, the college paid 41 cents to send this sucker out. And the current bulk rate for, um, for mail for nonprofit is 17.2 cents. Thank you. Any questions? Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all. Because that's what we do. We are here to serve you. Um, and I, and I do all the other important things they need to do. We think paying people is pretty important. Giving them an I have four things to, to uh, present to you. The first one I'd like to ask Dr. Oliver to join me on. And that is reflective of a council. This is something that Dr. Law has asked us to look into. Many other colleges already have this. Um, a model we already have in place would be FGO. An organizing group um, has been established with, under Dr. Oliver's leadership. They have been meeting. This is the organizing group. It is not the council. They are establishing the framework for it. For it. But, but during this, they have asked to dream about, about what this could do and be for our career service employees. And the, the dream is, is you know, we're, we're still there. We still have more follow-up with Dr. Law to do, but we really want to get a placeholder at the very least for this group. We are asking for uh, $10,000. The group has benchmarked where it is at other colleges, ranging from zero to a high of uh, $45,000, somewhere up in the panhandle. Um, that would be TCC, had, had that amount. Um, the, the main request that they are looking at, because they acknowledge that professional development is already meeting a lot of their professional development needs. They have um, presented ideas that would include activities for career service employees, bringing in paying for guest speakers for career service employees. Dr. Oliver, do you want to add anything? No, just that um, I've been privileged to work with this group. It was named, group named by the provost. They're very excited about getting coming together. This is pretty much the career equivalent of uh, FGO. It's an idea that Dr. Law has been uh, promoting, and it's a way that everybody gets involved in the life of the campus and gets, gets part of that communication stream. So 
Uh, it's just a little bit of money, a placeholder, so that when those bylaws come up and that group is finally formed, which will be later this spring, we'll, uh, if it's not on the list, it doesn't exist. This way it's on the list. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Dr. Oliver. Um, the second, and that is, that request is recurring. My second request is for one-time money. Um, talked about how we meet the needs of our employees. Very important way we meet the needs of you all and your families is through our insurance programs. We are asking for one-time money um, for a consultant to come in and work with us. I can either see you or see my paper. I think I should see my paper. Um, a couple things going on. You all know the story about our claims, how they've been increasing and increasing. There, there is a need to review our plan design, not only because they've increased from an average monthly of $700,000 about three years ago to at least a million a month in claims for our, on behalf of our employees that we pay. We also have the ongoing implementation of health care reform. All of the things related to, to these items are complex, um, require outside assistance, and that's what we are seeking. So we are asking for one-time money for a consultant to come in and manage what is a very highly specialized RFP process and help us implement whatever changes that, that we need to implement. Um, I have asked, I just did it, I don't know if I, I was supposed to do it, that we not wait till 7-1. Our plan year commences October 1st. The RFP, the design, the rollout, um, will take will take significant time. So I'm, I'm asking for possibly an allocation maybe in part from this year's um, one-time money. Um, my third request uh, has to do with digitizing our records. Again, this is a one-time request. This is not a recurring request. Um, many of you are aware that we have ImageNow. ImageNow is in financial aid. It's in central records, veterans affairs. We are in the process of implementing ImageNow, which will greatly enhance our workflow and efficiency in the office. But we have, we've estimated 800,000 plus documents, historic documents, that we have in our office. We do not have the capacity to do what needs to be done to get those in the system also, and then also make them um, searchable, linked into PeopleSoft, and all those good things. The good, the good news is there is a company that already has a contract with another college that we can go ahead and build off on immediately if, if this is approved. Um, personnel documents, we don't really feel comfortable about archiving and shredding like other college documents. Uh, we, there's a practical ongoing need to access these, even if they're employees who have left. They're still our retirees. We still have other issues that come up regarding them. There are legal requirements regarding the maintenance of those documents. So um, it's a $50,000 request, one time for this. And the other thing that I think is really critical as being part of the Emergency Management Council is this would help us significantly in being more proactive in our disaster recovery. These materials are not now in fireproof, waterproof places. They're just wherever we, we have, have room for them in the office. For my final request, I'd like to ask Dr. Williams to join me. Where is she? There she is. Um, another initiative we have is for learning plans. So we have a meeting, and again, this is preliminary because we're still doing legwork. We still need to follow up with Dr. Law, but, we, but the timing is right, of course, to bring this to you all to share some of, of what the dream is. So this would fund career service learning plan initiatives, meaning for career service employees, of which there are about 700. Mm -hmm. um, this would allow them to identify professional development needs and help us meet those needs. So the obvious question is, well, why do you need more? We already have professional development offerings. Well, let me share with you what, a little bit about what we've already been doing. Um, we currently support college-wide activities for employees that include faculty, career, and A&P. All manner and stripe of employee we support. We frequently already are paying for specialized training beyond what we offer centrally through professional development. We pay on behalf of employees for corporate training courses. We've paid for the SharePoint training. Uh, we pay for, um, much of the faculty reimbursement for the graduate courses, uh, licensure fees for video streaming library. We are now in a new era actually helping to offset some of the costs for faculty who are relocating. And that's coming out of that funding source as well plus resource material for training. 
I want to, I liked some of Yvonne's, how Yvonne approached her presentation, so I want to use some numbers as well. Three, the modalities in which we offer training. Just like we do for our credit training, we offer training face-to-face, -face, online, and blended. Fifty-nine, the number of workshops and classes we offered in the fall alone. Seven hundred and twelve, the number of participants in those workshops and classes during the fall only, career service faculty and A&P. 2,279 training hours in the fall alone. 10,584 total training hours when you include um, what we provided on All College Day mm -hmm. to so many of our employees. Two, the number of staff supporting all those activities. We have um, seven, about 700 career service employees. So what we are asking for is a $75,000 recurring amount that w so we could add users to our video streaming library. We, we, we have a certain number of licenses that were allowed for that. The use of more non uh, adjunct instructors, because clearly we don't have the staff already, so we're using adjuncts right now. Um, a, par a grade two part-time OPS support to help with the tracking, because if we're going to create learning plans for people, we have to create a framework and we have to track and we have to, to help with all of that. Re accompanying resource material. And we envision there might be some external training needs that we just can't meet that are worth investing in on behalf of our employees. Right. Dr. Williams? The um, magic of the learning plan is to help our career staff understand the importance of their role as frontline individuals in creating the college experience. And I think that our current process in evaluating our staff may be disconnected from the college goals. And so this is going to help streamline our staff, help train our staff, help them even advance and be and um, give them the guidance and help them understand where the college is going. So it, it really is a wonderful opportunity, not only for HR to be more involved, but also for the career staff. I totally support this initiative. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Good morning. From the Palladium Theater, uh, I realized watching uh, whenever we have a show, I get up and tell them all about all the shows that we're doing, our great mission, and then I see it's this is not going to be hard. Um, four years ago, almost at this exact time, uh, the Palladium was uh, became part of St. Petersburg College. It was a pretty amazing handover. A, a real jewel. However, it would also be virtually no connection at that point to the students of SPC, very little connection to even faculty and staff. And we've worked uh, very hard in the last four years to change that. And really in the last two years that has changed drastically and that brings sort of leads to this request uh, today. The college, uh, we've become a teaching site for the MIRA program. It's been a real nice marriage to have MIRA and the Palladium where the MIRA students can work on uh, our great shows of all kinds from high school uh, musicals to Tommy Emanuel, uh, the best guitarist in the world who was there the other night. It's, uh, it's amazing the kind of diversity that these kids get to work on. Uh, the college has contributed to a great sound system that's now state of the art and so these kids are working on what they will actually be working on in the field. Uh, however, we have, they're working mostly with part-time, very low-paid uh, technical crew. And we, we actually have less technical crew than we had when we were handed over to the college. Uh, and this request is to uh, take those one OPS position and sort of turn it into a full-time position. We need more professionalism in that job interns. This is the person who will be with them at every show. Uh, we also, when we bought the sound system, uh, we did it in a very modular way and this sound system and pieces of it can go out to support student activities all around, I'm almost afraid to say this in front of this crowd, to support student activities on all campuses because I don't think everyone knows that yet. 
uh, and we would we have loaned it out and we love to but we need uh, we need a full-time person to actually travel with this uh, with this equipment when it goes out because you can't send an OPS person uh, out to do that so uh, we also see this as an opportunity to reduce overtime when we get a, a show like an opera which is in for two to three weeks you can only have you can't be switching off your employees you have to have the person who is at all the rehearsals then do all the shows and you run into an overtime situation and we've been paying uh, OPS overtime and we really think we can reduce those costs by getting a full-time person who can then take some comp time during it during the downtimes because we do go up and down uh, I think I've touched on it we, we did 252 contracted events last year which is a record for us and we haven't counted this year yet because we're afraid to because it's beyond that and when you consider just the weeks that the college is closed it's just amazing uh, that we are on that kind of treadmill we uh, we uh, have two to three interns at almost all of those shows and events and they're really they're learning a lot we uh, we see this uh, in total with benefits as forty eight thousand six hundred and sixty two and uh, I appreciate your time any questions thank you much Morning. I'm Peg Connell and I'm here representing disability and I have two initiatives to bring forward today. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. The first request that I'm making is for an additional learning specialist to serve our students with disabilities. In the past three years, the number of students being served has increased by 44 percent from 791 in 2007 to 1,136 just the first two semesters of this year. Our staffing has not changed during this time. The Clearwater campus alone has jumped up to over 300 students that they are serving. Our Gibbs numbers have reached over 250 and really all of our campuses except the health center is now either at 200 or over 200 students with one learning specialist for each campus. The reauthorization of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was just reauthorized and which will be going into effect in March of this year, is going to change the way we do business. We've been operating on what nationally has been termed a medical model. That medical model basically says there's something wrong with the students, we need to get the documentation to find out what's wrong and we will fix it by providing accommodations. Under the new regulations, we are being encouraged nationally to go move into a more social model, a model that's more enabling for students. And what they are asking us to do is to spend a lot more time, especially up front, working with students, interviewing them, and together with the student, coming up with a plan that's going to work for the student's success. This is a much different model than looking at documentation and saying, okay, you've got this, 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 and this wrong with you, and therefore we're going to provide this, this, and this accommodation, and that will fix your problem. And if you have a problem, you contact us. We're not going to be calling you. All the onus is put on the students. What we want to do is respond to what the national what we're hearing from a national level. We want to be able to respond to that and to be able to spend more time with our students assisting them and coming up with these mutual plans. We're also looking at our retention. Right now we're doing, we're in the middle of an analysis of that and we're looking at about 71 percent from last semester to this semester. We would like that to improve and one of the ways that we want that to improve is by introducing more of a case management model as opposed again to this medical model that says if you have a problem you come to us. We are beginning to ask our learning specialists throughout the semester to pick up the phone, call their students and see how they're doing. And if there are problems, do some troubleshooting right up front. The interviews that we need to do in order to meet the new regulations and the recommendations from the Department of Justice and this case management model is going to require extra time on the part of our learning specialists to spend with students, especially in the upfront process. 
all of this, plus the work that they are basically doing involved in disability services, our learning specialists arrange testing, they assist in early registration, they're working with the VE specialists at our feeder schools, they're doing academic advising with their students, they're consulting with faculty in troubleshooting problems, and any other task that comes along that seems that is going to help students succeed. It's emphasizing for us the need for additional help in this department. We envision that this new learning specialist would actually be split part-time on the Clearwater campus to assist with the over 300 students there, part-time on the Gibbs campus, and we're also seeing a need arising in downtown so that there would be maybe two days on the Gibbs, two days at Clearwater, and one day downtown working with students. We expect the cost of this to the college would be about $65,000 depending at what level the person would come in, but that seems to be the average cost. So that's our first initiative. And for the second initiative, could I ask Jim Oliver to please come up? <laughs> He's the best cheerleader we know. making is for a staff assistant position on the Seminole campus. Our Seminole campus has actually seen the largest increase in students with disabilities in the past three years. They've actually doubled their numbers. So right now they're staffed with one learning specialist and one third hour OPS position. What we're asking is that that OPS position become a fully budgeted position. Seminole also has the largest number of high needs, low vision students college-wide who require specialized one-on-one -on -one assistance in both testing and sometimes in class situations. We try to help with some of our other services that we have available, but frequently what these students need is someone to sit with them one-on-one -on -one and either scribe a test, read a test to them, help them with the um, electronic work that we have as well. What we are asking is that this current 30-hour OPS position become a full-time budgeted position. The overall net cost to the college will be about $10,000 since we will no longer need that OPS position. So it's not a huge expense to the college, but it will make a huge difference for our students. And Jim, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I'll just do the visual again. <laughs> Thank you so much. I couldn't have said it better. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm not sure if I can do this without uh, Dr. Oliver up here, but <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <Some and all. laughs> uh, well, Okay, this is the um, this is the um, request for money to support the uh, new the building that we're going to purchase. We're calling it the uh, HEC Annex. It's actually the old JWB building. And at the moment, we are in the process of purchasing the building. We are also doing some design work for the first floor of that building, which will be by NUHS as soon as we get that finished, which we anticipate to be in the May time frame. So we're asking for maintenance, custodial and landscaping um, funding to support that facility, and we will be receiving funding from NUHS as a rental payment um, as they go in. Again, we're only talking about using uh, the whole first floor in this building, and we've been working with Dr. Nicotera and, U and NUHS on planning for the remainder of the building. The next request is for uh, Midtown, the uh, 10,000 square foot building that we are presently in in Midtown um, is on a month-to-month uh, -month lease right now. We are anticipating that that will probably turn into an um, uh, extended lease, hopefully, 
and uh, we're asking for maintenance, custodial, and landscaping support for that building, which um, we, we are required to do as part of our lease. This is the um, Tarpon, uh, Tarpon campus. This is the new Olympia building which contains the College of Education. Um, we have received uh, funding for this building already for six months from the operating uh, cost of new facilities from the state. When you put a new building online, they historically have funded you. This is funded at $7.22 a square foot. We will receive additional funding this year um, because last year they only funded us for six months because we did not occupy the building until January. So this request will round out the annual funding request um, for that building. And again, you, you can see that we will be receiving um, funding for that building. Maintenance, custodial, and landscaping. The positions were already approved and they were in the first six months. They've started now. But this is to support the, this is to support the facility. This is a new vet tech building that is opening up. Um, the new building is about uh, 10,000 square feet larger than the existing facility. Um, again, this is, uh, Personnel, custodial, mechanical, landscaping, security, network. Um, we worked with Dea on this issue. Dea, Dea and uh, um, Doug asked to, us to put this request in there also because, again, this site needs the uh, networking support, um, operating costs, materials, uh, custodial supplies. When you talk about custodial supplies, those are things like soap, paper towels, toilet paper, you know. Uh, landscaping, um, the utilities are in here also, um, but they've been transferred over to the overall utilities budget. Uh, you might notice also that we will receive $237,000 in operating cost for new facilities to support the operations of this, um, of this new facility. It's scheduled to open this summer and have students in there in the fall. This is, a, um, this is a new position that um, Ann Cooper and myself and Janice Buchanan worked together to uh, come up with um, a name for the collection. This is actually the new college collection, in parentheses, art collection. Um, the Gulf Coast Museum of Art collection is going to transfer over to Lipa Ratner. There are pieces and collections up there that are going to transfer over into, for a, a lack of a better term, a, a college collection. Um, and then this is the position that would work with students and faculty and the community to support that collection. Um, we, um, we have indicated that the person would do cataloging of all of those materials, which has not been done provide that on the web, they would have the opportunity, students and faculty would have the opportunity to do some research on the pieces. The person could go to the classroom, take pieces with them, do some seminars, um, also um, work within the community. There may be some opportunities. Students may want to see what a registrar does, and this person could uh, also um, mentoring internships. Anecdotally, if you uh, know Christine Rank Carter, who has been working with the Gulf Coast Museum Collection, um, she happens to know Duncan McClellan personally, and I think most of you in the room know who Duncan McClellan is. He's probably one of the, the premium, uh, premier uh, glass artists uh, in the area. We have a beautiful piece of his work that is sitting over in the foundation. So um, Duncan and Christine were talking the other day, and uh, there are some internship opportunities for our students, which uh, Christine has been working with Duncan on. She sent an email to Jonathan Steele. Jonathan uh, 
gave her some information on how that's worked through. But that, that's a great opportunity for our students to, to work and to do some internships. Uh, glass artistry is, is uh, really um, on the high side right now, very prominent in St. Pete. So um, I think possibly even with the folks down at the Morian and the Chihuly, there may be some other opportunities there. The uh, last request that I have is for Jason. Jason is the college's sustainability coordinator, and I know many of you in the room have worked with Jason over the last couple of years. Um, St. Petersburg College did not have a sustainability program, and we did not have any uh, green or energy courses when um, this initiative came about. So Jason has been very instrumental in working with Jim Connolly in getting our corporate training classes up with the USGBC. Jason teaches um, Design 1 and Design 2 at the college, and he has been the faculty member that has been working with our students as we design the new building, the Ethics and Social Science building on the Clearwater campus. He's also the person that is working with the engineering students to provide solar energy for that new building, which I think is going to be just amazing and what we're going to be able to do and try and get as much as possible off the grid for that building, and he's been very instrumental in that. He's a um, faculty advisor. He's working with us also um, on, uh, on the master planning college-wide. He's going to be uh, representing us essentially working with the other architectural firms and doing the coordination on all of that. Um, he, he's just done a lot of things and any of the um, sustainability outreach issues that we have with students, uh, Jason has been involved in. Um, if you look at the documentation that's been prepared on our two lead goal buildings, Jason has done all of that work. Jason is a lead AP, so when we are on our buildings and we want them lead certified, Jason will do the work that has to be done on that. If you hire an outside person to do that, it's about $80,000 a building um, to have a lead AP person come in, do all the paperwork, file it. So um, he's done a great job for us in that arena. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's, that finishes the second, second portion. Uh, we've got, this will be our, our break uh, for lunch. We're actually every, every job and, and we're, uh, we're actually ahead of schedule which puts a lot of pressure on the folks this afternoon to follow that. <laughs> so, uh, how about 12.15 uh, and you can eat in here and there's, should, they're bringing things. Now, Kathy, are we set or do we need a few more minutes? Okay, so take a break and then come back in and there's, there'll be food in the back. And